I love the way in which the Nice model takes what looks like a small problem, the eccentricities of Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, realizes that it's not a small problem after all, and spins the solution into a profound story of how the solar system might very well have evolved. We're going to tell a similar story today, and I would say that this one is significantly less secure. The, the problem that the Nice model solves, the problems that the Nice model solves, uh, were, were big problems that are, that are clearly there in the solar system, eccentricities, cause of late heavy bombardment. The problem that this next one solves is one that might be a problem, um, and it might not be a problem at all, but we're, well, let's talk about what the problem is and what the solution is. The problem is Mars is too small. What do I mean by Mars is too small? What I mean is that if you try to simulate the formation of the terrestrial planets using these processes that we've talked about, dust sticking together to form planetesimals, planetesimals eventually growing up to become oligarchs, a long period of time as the oligarchs finally combine together to form terrestrial planets. If you take those processes and use the disk of material that we think the sun had, you don't get Mars. What do you get instead? Well, here's a set of simulations where this has been attempted, and we're looking at semi-major axis down here of the, the final planet and mass in Earth masses up here. And of course, here's the Earth, one AU, one Earth mass, Sitting right here, here's Venus, here's Mercury, here's Mars. Now we do have a lack of large objects out through here, and that's of course because Jupiter is preventing large things from forming out there. But we also have a lot of large objects through here. These are planets that we don't have in our solar system, something around the distance of Mars, but mass of something closer to the Earth. These simulations do give things about the mass of Venus, about the mass of, of the Earth. Mercury is small, but Mercury is, we know, had a giant impact that caused problems to it. And the other thing that these simulations show is a lot of medium Mars-sized objects actually scattered out further in the solar system where we don't have those either. So what's the story? Why do we not have a large object right here where Mars is? This is called the Mars problem. Why do I say this is only maybe a problem? Well, it's certainly an interesting problem, but, but these things are stochastic. You cannot use these simulations to predict precisely what our planets should end up like. You can use these simulations to predict the range of things that our planet should end up like. And it's true, we don't really have anything in the right range in through here, and certainly not in the right range in through here. But there's just a lot of chance involved. and Maybe we just got lucky or unlucky, depending on how you want to think about it at Mars. Maybe not. Maybe this is a real Mars problem. Let's go on the assumption as a problem, and let's think about ways to solve it. One solution was found in a set of simulations by Hansen in 2009, around the same year, which was, well, you might have thought the solution would be, well, just make less mass out here where Mars is. Here's the same sort of plot, semi-major axis. Now we have mass on a log scale, so it looks a little bit different. Here's one Earth mass up here, tenth of an Earth mass, hundredth of an Earth, Earth mass. And again, you have Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. What was found was that if you just had less material out through here, it still didn't work. You still got those objects more massive objects scattered out into the asteroid belt, you still had a more massive Mars. What you really needed to do was confine all of the disk to a fairly small annulus. And that annulus was something like 0.7 to 1 AU. If you define, confine all the disk into this annulus, what happens is the oligarchs grow, and when they become their isolation mass, they start to eventually gravitationally interact, and they spread out, they scatter each other around. Not only do they scatter each other around, but some of them get scattered so far out that they never interact with other oligarchs again. That is the origin of these objects out through here. They are single oligarchs that got scattered out into the outer part of the disk beyond where all the other oligarchs are, and they are left in place. A really cool thing about this idea is that one of the things that we've known about Mars for a while is that it appears that the accretion time scale of Mars is short. Something like, maybe, maybe as short as 1.5 million years. This comes from things like, if you remember the discussion of hafnium tungsten dating of the, uh, of the formation of the core of the Earth and some more recent work also, this is a much shorter time scale than it took the, we think, 100 million years for these objects to form. 
for a while, this 1.5 million years was a complete mystery. How could it be? We think that it takes 100 million years to form terrestrial planets, and yet Mars appeared so comparatively early in the history of the solar system. Well, this could be a solution. It could be just an oligarch that got scattered out there, never to interact again. The big planets form in through here, the Venus-sized things, the Earth-sized things, more or less the same pattern in through here, and more or less in these regions through here. Pretty cool. This is a solution to the Mars problem, but it doesn't really tell you anything. It tells you if the disk were like this, this would solve the Mars problem. Why the heck would the disk be like this? A solution to this has been now termed the Grand Tack Model. I don't know where they come up with these names. Um, and this is one that was uh, recently published by Welsh et al. in Nature. And everything I'm going to show you from now on is from that model. It starts out with uh, several interesting questions. One question is, and we know that hot Jupiters exist, and we even think we know why hot Jupiters exist. We think they exist because stars here, something like Jupiter starts to form, and there's still a disk of gas and dust around it, and Jupiter starts to eat up all the gas that's around it and makes a gap in the disk. There's gas inside, there's gas outside, and there's not gas in the middle. The gas inside and the gas outside both cause torques on Jupiter, which would cause Jupiter's, Jupiter to move. In the short version of the story, there's so much more mass outside here that the torques on the outside push inward. Of course, the torques on the inside push outward. But there's so much more mass that you get more of a push in than out. And so the planet migrates its way in until we still don't know exactly why they stop it around three days. But we think that's the process by which we get hot Jupiters. So if I were to plot the total mass of the disk, interior and exterior, this is something like mass, this is something like distance, not really semi-major axis, but distance, and let's say Jupiter, the forming Jupiter is right here. We have mass on the interior, and it goes down to zero where Jupiter is, and its mass on the exterior goes up here. Now usually you're used to me drawing this thing that looks kind of like this. This is the mass per unit area now. This is just the total mass. So the total mass interior is small even if the mass per unit area is bigger. That's why they look different. Now imagine that Jupiter is minding its own business, migrating inward, and then exterior to Jupiter another planet forms. Let's call it Saturn. It does the same thing. It probably forms out here at the ice line like it should, and it takes away the gas and takes away way to guess. And it starts to migrate inward also. There's less mass in through here than outward. Eventually, it's going to catch up with Jupiter. Because there's a lot more mass out here than there is in here. And we'll be left in a situation that looks sort of like this. It tends to stop when it's in a resonance. Tend to stop and when it's in maybe the, the two to one resonance or the three to two resonance when these two things are resonantly interacting. Now, I've always said that when you get these two things resonantly interacting, they start to shake and everything goes crazy, but you have so much gas around that it stabilizes them. They stay calm with all this gas around, and so they're not going crazy. These guys could have migrated quite a bit inward. Let's say they've migrated into 2AU at this point. When Saturn catches up, an interesting thing happens. Jupiter no longer sees a massive chunk of gas behind it. There's just this wimpy little Saturn thing and then gas way out there. And so the torque from the inner part of the disk suddenly pushes Jupiter faster this way than the torque from way out here pushes it inward. So Jupiter, although it had been started out out here and had moved in, suddenly turns around and starts to move back outward. When it turns around and moves back outward, it locks Saturn into this resonance, just like the way the Kuiper Belt objects did or maybe didn't lock into a resonance with Neptune when they got pushed out. And so Jupiter goes outward, Neptune goes outward with it in resonance. If you're thinking really hard, you might remember that this could well be the start of the Nice model. Suddenly Jupiter and Saturn are in resonance. If the gas were to all disappear suddenly, we would then, boom, start the Nice model. So this is all pre-Nice model as there's still gas and as these, things are, as these things are going. The consequence of this, the important consequence of this, is that this gas disk right here has been truncated down to about 1 AU. This is what we were looking for. The reason in this scenario that Mars is so small is because indeed the gas disk was in an annulus at 1 AU because Jupiter came in all the way into maybe 2 AU. Let's take a look at what a simulation of this really looks like. But here's the actual simulations that, that show what happens if Jupiter is moving in, Saturn is coming up behind it, 
small bodies are strewn everywhere in the solar system. And here's something I want you to notice is the time scales here. Here's zero, and the longest time scale we get to is 600,000 years. Remember that the, the Nice model is 600 million years until that explosion potentially happens. So this is all well before the Nice model ever starts. This is when there's still all this gas still in the disk. And the gas in the disk is the thing that makes Jupiter and Saturn move. Okay, so here we start out with a Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune. And the size of them shows how big they are. Notice they're all a little bit smaller to begin with, except for Jupiter. Jupiter is big enough that it, that it makes a gap in its disk, and as soon as it makes a gap in its disk, it starts to move. The other thing that's happening is that in through here there are planetesimals and oligarchs. The round circles are oligarchs, the little red things are planetesimals, and the oligarchs are allowed to coagulate together to try to form larger planets. The planetesimals just get scattered as they, as they go in. So Jupiter's moving inward, and note what happens. Look, one of these oligarchs has already been scattered. It's, it's crossing Jupiter's orbit. It's not going to last for long. These ones that are closest to where Jupiter migrates in get very high eccentricities, you can see through here. But the rest of these oligarchs stay at pretty low eccentricity, and they're the ones that are starting to eventually merge. Jupiter continues its inward migration, but notice that it slows. And at this point, Saturn has gotten big enough that it, too, makes a gap in the disk. When that happens, it very rapidly moves in until it gets into a resonance, in this case, the 3 to 2 resonance with Jupiter and it stops Jupiter from migrating any further. But that's okay, Jupiter's already done its damage. It has depleted the disk of material into about here. Then, well, in fact, even into about here. You can see that these oligarchs are high eccentricity. They won't last for long. Um, maybe some of them will be scattered out to places like where Mars is now. As soon as Saturn catches up with Jupiter, Sa Jupiter doesn't see a disk behind it anymore. They both start to migrate back outward fairly quickly, and they stay in this resonance. Jupiter captures Saturn into this resonance, just like Kuiper Belt objects get captured by Neptune, and they migrate back outward, and Uranus and Neptune get captured into the resonances too, and they migrate outward in sync. At perhaps about 500,000 years, there's not enough disk material left to let Jupiter migrate anymore, and so they're left with what is the starting condition now of the Nice model, which is that we have four giant planets all in resonances, all about to now go unstable because the gas suddenly has disappeared. But more importantly, let's watch what happens to the other things. The small planets, the terrestrial planets, form, particularly after Jupiter leaves and leaves them alone, they form something like four terrestrial planets, a small one, two big ones, and another small one further outside. This other small one further outside, we can't quite track exactly which one it was, but it was one of these that got flung outward early on, like we talked about for Mars. What else happens? Well, let's take a look at these, these small planetesimals. In, inside of Jupiter, they're all colored red. Uh, in between the giant planets, they're light blue. Outside, they're colored dark blue. What does that mean? Well, we don't really know, but you could imagine these are more rocky. These are more carbon-rich, ice-rich, and these really are rock, uh, icy things out in the Kuiper Belt. And the important thing is they mix up. Notice that as Jupiter moves in, it scatters some of these blue carbony objects inward. See these ones in through here? And it scatters some of the red stony things outward. You can see them out through here. And as these objects plow out into what's going to become the Kuiper Belt, you can even see some of these things that are potentially Kuiper Belt-ish objects in through here. You can see them close into the giant planets. When all of the objects have been cleared out by 600,000 years, or 150 million years for the final assembly, you can see what happens. We don't have any small bodies left in any of these unstable regions, and we have something that looks exactly like the asteroid belt. The asteroid belt is inside of this dashed line. The objects that were left over are inside this dashed line. And more importantly, if you remember about the asteroid belt, the composition of the asteroid belt was a function of distance from the sun. Closer to the sun, if the Earth, Earth was here, Mars was here, closer to the sun, it's mostly full of S-type asteroids, those stony-type asteroids. Further from the sun, it seems to be mostly full of those C-type, the carbonaceous asteroids. And as you get even further out, there's D-types and P-types, uh, which are sort of unknown exactly what they are, but certainly more like carbonaceous carbon dark things. You see a similar process here. Closer to the sun, there's more red. These would be the stony things that were formed here. Further from the sun, there's more of the light blue. These would be these. It's not clear how many of the really dark blue, if any of them, get, uh, get lodged in through here. So 
What does this tell us? This tells us that this process can explain the problem that we were trying to solve. We were trying to solve the problem of the small mass of Mars. We can do it by not invoking any horrendous process. It's just migration of planets that we know works, that we know happens in other planetary systems. And it, in fact, it solves another sort of philosophical problem, which was why did Jupiter not migrate? And the answer is it did migrate. It just migrated in and it migrated out again. And the, the inward is the standard inward, and the outward was because of Saturn coming up close to it and then letting it get driven back out again. The model also explains the asteroids and their locations and their compositions, sort of, and certainly where those, how those compositions are graded. So I'd have to say it's a, it's a very successful model. Is it what happened in the solar system? I don't know. It's a difficult one to answer because this is a model that, for now, nobody has come up with any of the really clever tests that are needed to, to tell whether this happened or didn't happen. What you would like to be able to do is find something in the solar system that you could observe and say, if this process really happened, then we will observe this. If this process didn't happen, we will observe this. We haven't found it yet. We're looking uh, with luck. We'll have an answer for you one of these days. And I hate to end this way like I always do. Stay tuned. <laughs>